deep in the coastal hills of western Oregon. Four axle EMDs power trains over what was supposed to be a transcontinental railroad. This backwoods road, paved with timber and steel, weaves through America's premier timber producing lands on a route first laid in 1884. Operated today by the Portland and Western Railroad, a subsidiary of Genesee and Wyoming, its purpose is to serve a Georgia Pacific paper mill in the small town of Toledo. Boxcars, center beams, and an aging fleet of wood chip gondolas make the 75 mile journey over the Toledo branch nearly every day between its namesake town and Albany in the lush Willamette Valley. In part one of this two part series on the Toledo branch, we will show you the GP paper mill and take a tour of the Western Cascade Industries Sawmill, which ships a few loads by rail each week. We will then follow the railroad as it charts an inland course along the Yaquina River, passing the ghosts of stations, mills, and communities long forgotten. The climax of today's trip is a stiff 2.58% mountain grade over the summit of the coast range. The classic two-stroke EMDs thunder up the west side, lugging heavy trains of container board from the paper mill. This is Portland and Western's Toledo Branch, Part 1. The Portland and Western is a Class II railroad operating on 516 miles of ex-Southern Pacific and Burlington Northern branch lines in Northwest Oregon. Today we are focusing on the Toledo branch line, which runs west of PNW's Albany Yard for 75 miles through the coast range to service a Georgia Pacific paper mill in Toledo. The line originally continued west to the former town site of Yaquina, a few miles upriver from present-day Newport. That line was removed in the early 20th century. The westbound Toledo hauler is usually a nocturnal train, so we will be following the eastbound move starting at Toledo near milepost 766. The rails follow the meandering Yaquina River past a former spur at Burpee and other historic yet forgotten stations and sightings such as Stores, Elk City, and Morrison. After passing through Tunnel 24, the only remaining tunnel on the line, we visit Chitwood and the site of a beautifully preserved covered bridge. Then on through Eddyville, the only remaining siding between Toledo and Summit. The lonely track continues its winding course along the Aquina River through the old communities of Norton's and Nashville. The railroad crosses the Aquina 15 times and makes its final crossing here on a horseshoe curve. At this point, the mostly level running is over as trains experience a 4-mile grade of 2.58% that twists and bends to the top of the coast range and an elevation change from 239 to 718 feet above sea level. It is a great show of raw horsepower versus gravity and we will take you deep into the remote hills to show you the action. Every story has a beginning, and this one opens along the beautiful central coast of Oregon near the city of Newport, the midway point between Seattle and San Francisco. The elegant arches of the Aquita Bay Bridge lift US 101 over a body of water that plays a significant role in today's adventure. The 3200 foot long bridge is the centerpiece of Newport and one of the most recognizable landmarks of the Oregon coast. The local economy is powered mainly by recreation and tourism, along with commercial fishing. Newport started life as a post office in 1868. Fourteen years later, it was incorporated as a town. In the late 19th century, the big news wasn't Newport, 
but a little community a few miles upriver named Yaquina. This was to be the western terminus of a transcontinental railroad and a great seaport that rivaled San Francisco and New York City. This was the dream of Colonel Thomas E. Hogg. In December of 1884, that dream seemed to be alive and well with the arrival of the Oregon Pacific Railroad from the Willamette Valley. Passengers arrived at Station Yaquina by train and boarded steamboats bound for Newport. Goods such as grain and quarried rock were reloaded onto ships for San Francisco. A turntable and roundhouse were kept busy with locomotives and the town grew to over 2,000 residents. Yaquina was reportedly a dry town and the floating building beyond the roundhouse in this image was a saloon which was not technically within the city limits. A popular hangout for railroaders, the story goes that if an engineer was sober enough to walk the gangplank without falling in the river, then he was sober enough to operate the train. Colonel Hogg's dream of a transcontinental railroad never came to fruition, and his Oregon Pacific went through several names, including the Oregon Central and Eastern, the Corvallis and Eastern, and in 1915, it became part of the Southern Pacific. As for a major international port, well, that was indeed in Oregon's future, but it happened to the north at the confluence of the Willamette and Columbia Rivers, what we know today as Portland. The big dream of the major port city of Yaquina is mostly lost to history. Today, it is an RV park on a bend of the river about four miles east of Newport. This plaque gives the curious a glimpse into what was and what never was to be. Although this sign refers to this spot as Yaquina City, the name on the post office that once existed here and what appeared on the railroad timetable was simply Yaquina. Trains followed the north bank of the river over numerous trestles like this one over Boone Slough. It's 1925 and a westbound Southern Pacific train from Corvallis is crossing the trestle with passengers and mail for Yaquina. In 1936, SP abandoned this 8.4 mile section of track between Toledo and Yaquina. And to this day, evidence of the main line can still be seen. Pilings and bridge supports rise out of the muddy north bank of the river. A piece of history slowly succumbing to the elements. Much of the old grade is now known to locals as the North Bay Road between Toledo and Newport. Instead of sprawling streets and skyscrapers, the banks of the Aquita River are mostly quiet save a few passing cars and fishing boats navigating the channel. These ocean-going vessels head upstream to the port of Toledo for maintenance and storage and come from as far away as Alaska. One of those boats is the 125-foot-long steel crab fishing vessel named Kiska Sea. It operates in the Bering Sea off the Aleutian Islands of Alaska, and if it looks familiar, it has been featured in the reality TV series, Deadliest Catch. Since before the coming of the railroad in 1884, the Yaquina River served as a major source of transportation. It is an estuary where freshwater streams mix with the salt water of the Pacific Ocean. The river has an eight-foot tide due to the gravitational pull of the moon. Its flow changes direction four times every lunar day, with two high tides and two low tides occurring every 24 hours and 50 minutes. As we follow the railroad upstream, you will notice the changes in the water level and the direction of its current. Just upriver from Toledo, a pair of old barges are stuck in the muddy bank. Barges like these were used for transporting lumber from riverside mills and rock from various quarries, once active at several points along the Aquina. 
These barges most likely belonged to the Cascadia Lumber Company, which had a mill site here. This image from 1960 shows the mill, and quite possibly those same barges moored along the channel. Now with their seaworthy days long behind them, these old relics join the bleached bones of the trestles to Yaquina in a slow dissolve into history. Not all is fading away. The Georgia Pacific paper mill has remained the heartbeat of the local economy since the early 1960s. The mill centers around three paper making machines which churn out container board used in making cardboard boxes. The birth of the online retail market has played a role in the mill's continued success. Georgia Pacific has three paper mills in Oregon and is the Portland and Western's largest customer. In fact, this mill is the only reason these tracks are still here. A loop track runs all the way around the mill, resembling a model railroad. Current switching is done by Watco, and a pair of engines take care of the chores of spotting cars where needed in the industrial park. These box cars are setting adjacent to the paper making machines. When loaded, they will make their way east to Georgia Pacific's various customers throughout the western states. Every summer, Toledo hosts a wooden boat show. This steam-powered paddle boat is giving rides up and down the river from Depot Slough. It passes beneath a great white tube which houses a conveyor transporting wood chips dumped from rail cars to the paper mill. The great white building in the background houses a rollover where wood chip gondolas are emptied. This building was once part of the C.D. Johnson Sawmill. A subsidiary of Pacific Spruce Company, the C.D. Johnson Sawmill was the largest to operate in Toledo. In fact, it had the distinction of being the largest spruce sawmill in the world at the time. In 1952, the C.D. Johnson Mill was sold to Georgia Pacific, which later built the paper mill we see today. The big sawmills may be a thing of the past in Toledo, although there is still one place where the singing of saw blades can be heard. Western Cascade Industries has been in operation since 1998. A softwood lumber producer, WCI, takes logs generally considered too small for most sawmills. These are referred to as chip and saw logs. They are used to make building studs such as 2x4s, 2x6s, and the like. The portions of the logs too small for this mill are fed through a chipper and trucked to the nearby GP paper mill. The WCI mill runs efficiently, not wasting any of the wood. Much of the lumber is shipped by truck. However, they do send a few loads weekly by rail. The reload track is at the old Cascadia mill site, just east of town. This mixed load of green fur is bound for a customer 560 miles away in Plainhaven, California. The forklift operator skillfully loads the center beam, which is scheduled to depart the following morning. During the loading process, the operator is careful to alternate sides to balance out the weight. If only one side of the car was loaded, it would easily tip over. Thank you. 
Just west of the reload, PNWR 2306 leads a late-running Toledo hauler into town behind an all-EMD lash-up. Portland and Western uses a mix of GP39-2s and GP40s on the Toledo branch. The exception on this train is the blue unit number 2152, which is a non-turbocharged GP38-2. The westbound hauler usually arrives in the early morning hours before 5 a.m., so this move is one we rarely get to see in daylight. A string of wood chip gondolas make up the head end. The train stops to throw a switch before proceeding into the mill. These cars have a maximum gross weight of 263,000 pounds when loaded. That means each wheel is exerting a force of over 32,000 pounds to the rail. In addition to chip guns, box cars loaded with recycled paper and empty box cars finish out a typical train. Named for Toledo, Ohio, the town began life as a settlement called Graham's Landing in 1866. In this view from around 1913, the westbound Corvallis and Eastern passenger train is stopped at the depot before continuing to Yaquina. Today, a railroad museum, post office, and park reside on the ground where the depot once stood. This 45-ton switcher, nicknamed Loki, dates back to the C.D. Johnson years. The same is true for the 1922 Baldwin named the GP1 spot. The steam engine is on display near the tracks often occupied by loaded wood chip gondolas, waiting their turn to be dumped at the rollover. These cars are as much a part of the Toledo landscape as the buildings in the background along Main Street. Power for the Toledo hauler creep through the pre-dawn dark after dropping their cars near the paper mill. They will continue west to grab a string of empty wood chip gondolas which are parked near the end of track around milepost 766. Two of the GP40Ps in this consist are mated to slugs, a practice that goes back to the Southern Pacific years. We will get to see these units in action quite a few times today as we head for the summit of the coast range. Except for the graveyard shift at the mill, most of Toledo's 3,600 residents are asleep as the train heads for the east end of the yard on the main track. This is the typical consist for eastbounds. Heavier loaded box cars are up front, while the lighter empty wood chip guns make up the rear of the train. The 3002 will be stopping to pick up a loaded center beam of fresh cut WCI lumber before officially starting east. With its train made up, the eastbound Toledo patch begins its 75-mile journey through the coast range to Albany. Back in the days when track speeds were higher on this line, a single crew could make the entire run and back without exceeding their hours of service. But as track conditions worsened and more speed restrictions were added, a patch crew often had to be called to retrieve the eastbound Toledo hauler. Eventually, that job became permanent and was given the name 
the patch job. Let's follow the train as it begins its leisurely journey upriver. This water level course through the Oregon Coast Range leads through some of the best timber producing land in the world. The evergreens above the train are coastal Douglas fir. Native to the Pacific Northwest, the softwood timber is the preferred choice for young forests. Its strength and durability makes it ideal for the construction market and is preferred by mills such as WCI. Douglas or Doug fir is also a popular choice for the Christmas tree market. A few hardwoods find their way into the mix along the right-of-way including red alder and big leaf maple. In this scene from early spring, their leaves are just coming on. Wheel flanges sing as a train bends around the first of many curves. The first several miles of track are on the remote north bank of the river. Crossings are few and far between, with only the remnants of old homesteads and mill sites long abandoned. The freedom of flight gives us the opportunity to really enjoy the train in its surroundings. It's a clear and cold February morning in 2018, as the eastbound patch job approaches milepost 761. Today's train has three loads of green dug fir lumber from WCI. These loads will eventually head south on the UP for customers in California. In the fall, maple can provide a nice splash of color against the more dominant Douglas fir. The patch job works around a big bend in the Aquinnah near milepost 760.5. It's the 17th day of October, and a series of fall storms have been bringing rain and wind to the central Oregon coast, and soon all the deciduous trees will be bare. More rain is forecast for the day, and the low clouds cast their gray shadows over the land.
This train makes the 150-mile round trip between Toledo and Albany six days a week. Many miles of track pass through the natural tunnel of maples, which deposit their big leaves in a thick layer on the locomotives in the fall. A salmon fisherman tries his luck in the river, which has swelled due to high tide and recent rains. At this point, the train is passing the former siding of stores. A small logging operation is underway above the grade near milepost 760. Fallers have already cut a mixed stand of dug fir, maple, and alder. And now a small Thunderbird yarder is at work pulling the logs to a landing at the top of the ridge. Choker setters attach cables to the logs. They are attached via a drop line to the yellow Acme motorized carriage which rides a bigger cable called the Skyline. The logs being pulled up the hill are known as a turn. Each turn is sorted into a deck at the landing and put on a truck for a mill. While the loggers continue their work, PNWR number 2308 quietly leads the patch job along the river below. It's a scene of a train that relies on forest products lumbering through a working forest. On the Toledo branch, the loggers don't keep all the fun to themselves. Sometimes the railroad ends up with a small logging operation of its own. It's early 2008, and fierce winter storms have taken their toll on the Pacific Northwest. A late-running Toledo hauler has dropped its train near milepost 760, leaving a GP40 slug set to keep the air up on the 60-plus car train, while the lead engines run light a mile to the west. A series of slides have covered the track with debris, including a tree that is much too large for maintenance of way to handle on their own. By running a cable and a pulley at the base of a nearby tree, these EMD skidders are called on to do some yarding of their own. And they do so without even breaking a sweat. Unexpected tasks like this help break up the monotony of simply running trains or watching the mileposts go by. Yet for train crews, it is all part of a day's work on the Toledo branch.
The area around milepost 761 has had a long history of slides. On February 10, 1962, this westbound 105 car Toledo hauler hit a rock slide, derailing four SD9s and eight cars partway back in the train. Although the lead engine was submerged, the engineer and fireman were able to get to safety. To retrieve the engines out of the river, a logging company was hired to erect a pair of A-frames which hoisted the 180-ton locomotives back to the grade. Meanwhile, a steam-powered crane called the Big Hook was called out of Eugene to clean up the derailed cars. A similar accident happened here in 1977, but fortunately, the engines didn't derail that time. That is the bugle of the Roosevelt elk, the third largest mammal in North America. There are nearly 30 in this herd which frequent the area during the winter months. This field between the track and the river is a perfect venue for wintertime sports. Bull elk are normally known for their large antlers which are shed in the fall and winter. These bareheaded boys tussle about while the cows forage for food ahead of calving season. As the train approaches, the elk decide to head for higher ground. In the early spring, the elk have moved on to other parts of the coast range. The eastbound Toledo Patch job heads upriver.
An old teepee burner is mostly hidden in the trees near Elk City at milepost 757. This is what remains of a sawmill once operated by the Benton County Lumber Company. The remoteness of the mill on the north side of the river led to its demise since log trucks had to cross a rickety bridge at Elk City to reach it. When the bridge could no longer support the weight of the trucks, the mill was closed. Southern Pacific listings show the mill had ceased operation by the early 1960s. Today, a spur track still exists at the old mill site. Established in 1866 under the name Newton, Elk City is one of the oldest towns between Yaquina and Corvallis. This was the head of navigable waters on the Yaquina River and the western end of a wagon road that led from the valley. A post office and mill were established here in 1868 and later it became a stop on the Oregon Pacific. The depot was a prominent part of the busy town which was then tied to the rest of the world by rails. Today, the mill, depot, and covered bridge that spanned the river are long gone. A few residences and a park are all that remain. We are standing at the old mill site on a cool December morning when the sun is reluctant to break over the horizon. On a warm spring morning, the westbound hauler passes the confluence of the Big Elk and Yaquina Rivers. Big leaf maple trees overhang the banks of the Aquina as we continue upstream from Elk City. In the early spring, greenish yellow flowers appear before the maple tree's signature leaves develop. A thick coat of green moss and ferns cover the trunk and branches, giving the tree some color even during the winter months.
About three miles east of Elk City, there once stood a station and post office known as Morrison. Back in the days of the Oregon Pacific and Corvallis and Eastern, this was milepost 20.9. Yaquina was milepost zero. Here, the track crosses over the mouth of Bear Creek. On the east side of this bridge was once a spur that led to the Pioneer Sandstone Quarry. Between 1894 and 1898, over 300,000 cubic feet of sandstone came out of this quarry. Some of it went to San Francisco for the construction of historic buildings like the Emporium and Call Building. Other sandstone became part of the Yaquina Bay jetties at Newport and several other structures around Oregon. The post office was later renamed Pioneer, while the railroad station kept the Morrison name. In August of 1915, Morrison made its debut in a Southern Pacific timetable as milepost 753.8. Today, a talking detector marks the exact spot. WT detector, milepost 753.8. No defects. No defects. This large piece of sandstone and detector box stand on the old grade to the quarry which has since become quite overgrown and forgotten, except by old-timers who still live in the area. Just east of Morrison, the patch job rounds a curve on a rainy October day. This power consist contains both the 3002 and 3001 mated to their slugs. These slugs have no prime mover and are classified as RPE4Ds. They started life in 1961 as GP18 locomotives pulling freight for the Norfolk and Western. The Yaquina River serves as the railroad's guide as trains navigate the coast range. The Toledo branch crosses the river 15 times on nostalgic wooden trestles. Southern Pacific numbered the crossings from east to west, with the first crossing being near the headwaters of the river near Nashville. This is the 15th crossing with the eastbound patch. The Elk City Road squeezes under the railroad here, as it has for over 100 years. This crossing predates the automobile and hasn't changed much from when this was just a wagon road. In 
A late-running Toledo hauler crosses the trestle on a warm spring morning. Watch how the bridge timbers flex under the weight of the train. The 15th crossing is located at milepost 753. A classic Southern Pacific water barrel sticks out of the ballast near the west end of the trestle. These water barrels were placed at each end of all wooden trestles and bridges on the SP. GP39-2 number 2315 leads the patch over the 15th crossing of the Aquina in the spring of 2020. On a dark winter's morning, the eastbound patch makes the crossing. River fog often settles in in low-lying areas overnight, burning off by mid-morning. This is the 14th crossing.
The 13th crossing is located at milepost 752.44. PNWR 3003 leads the way as the engineer throttles up after making a crew change. The total length of this bridge is 362 feet. It is located at the west end of the only remaining tunnel on the line, known as Tunnel 24. In the pre-Southern Pacific years, this was Tunnel 1. It was a site of a tragic train wreck in April of 1895. This westbound Oregon Pacific train had just come out of the tunnel when the bridge collapsed behind the engine. Fifteen cars went into the river, leaving just the engine, Oregon Central and Eastern No. 2, its tender, and caboose left precariously perched on the remaining structures. The train's conductor and brakeman were both killed in this accident at what was known then as Bridge 24, which just happens to be the 13th crossing of the river. This current bridge dates back to 1915, with the girder deck added in 1928. It is showing its age in the 21st century, and as the heavy locomotives cross, we pray we never see a repeat of what happened here in 1895. A total of three tunnels were originally built for the Aquinnah branch. Two others were located farther to the east on the stiff grade up to Summit and were removed in the 1960s. This tunnel is 673 feet in length and allows the railroad to bypass an unnecessary jog in the river. A short spur track once used for storing maintenance of way equipment exists at the east end. The east bore of this tunnel looks like a big hole in a patch of blackberries and salmonberries where trains magically appear coming from mysterious worlds on the other side.
Shortly after exiting Tunnel 24, the railroad makes the 12th crossing of the river at milepost 752.12. On a typical rainy Oregon spring morning, the patch job appears out of the base of a nearby hillside and crosses the 298-foot bridge. During this line's heyday in the 1960s and 70s, it was not uncommon to see 100-plus car trains servicing the GP paper and sawmills in Toledo. Many factors over the last several decades have led to the decrease in car count, one of which flies over the railroad right here. Major improvements to Highway 20 paved the way for a large increase in competing truck traffic. This new bypass straightens several miles of narrow winding roadway, which in the past restricted long-haul trucks. There were originally 62 bridges between Yaquina and the summit of the coast range. One of those today is the 11th crossing of the Yaquina at milepost 751.76. Some of the wood supports have been replaced with steel, making us feel a little more comfortable getting this shot. The 3002 leads the patch past a small thinning operation between the 10th and 9th crossings of the Aquina.
This was once the location of a planer mill that was serviced by the railroad. Another wigwam sits in the trees marking the old mill site. It's hard to believe this forest was once an open valley with fields surrounding the mill. It was planted to timber after the mill closed sometime in the mid 20th century and now is being thinned to promote the health and growth of the trees. A truck with two sizes of cut to length logs passes over a temporary crossing put in for the logging operation. Sawdust burners like this were once a mandatory safety requirement for mills. It was better to burn the excess sawdust in a controlled situation like this teepee burner than to let it burn down the whole mill. These burners were later outlawed in Oregon and Washington in the 1970s for air quality concerns and other uses were found for the excess sawdust. The once fragrant scent of wood smoke has faded into the cool dampness of the forest. There are 54 covered bridges in Oregon. One of them frames the train at Chitwood, milepost 750.6. The Chitwood Covered Bridge was built in 1926 the third bridge to be built at this site. The first two bridges were not covered and suffered from rot due to the heavy rains that fall annually in this region. Chitwood is one of the early stations on the railroad. Using an optical time machine, we can peer into what was here more than 100 years ago. Looking like a Hollywood set, a horse is tied to the hitching rail at the Durkee store which faces the tracks. The tracks were the town's main street. This turn of the century image of Chitwood shows the young community after a winter storm that swept through the lower elevations. Note the open trusses on the earlier bridge over the Aquina. It was built so people across the river could access the railroad, by far the best source of transportation. Eastbound Corvallis and Eastern Engine No. 6 eases to a stop at the depot, just down from the store. According to a timetable from 1900, this train left Yaquina at 7 a.m. and arrived at Chitwood at 8.10. The depot was torn down in November of 1940. The classic Southern Pacific sign now adorns the preserved covered bridge. Somewhat duplicating the shot in October of 1995, SP Daylight No. 4449 passes the former depot site on an eastbound excursion. This special train was in celebration of the newly established Willamette and Pacific Railroad which took over operations when Southern Pacific spun off their branch lines to other operators in the early 1990s. Returning to the same scene nearly 24 years to the day in 2019, Portland and Western's Toledo Patch heads through Chitwood. Note the difference in the train's pace from the 1995 scene. Track speed is now half of what it used to be in the early 1990s. The depot, store and nearby mill have since faded into history 
and for a while it looked as if the covered bridge would see the same fate. In 1984, the bridge was restored through a federally funded project. It is currently listed on the National Register of Historic Places in Oregon and preserved so a present generation can take a drive through a piece of history. East of Chitwood, the patch passes through a natural tunnel of leaves on a foggy August morning. On the Corvallis and Eastern timetable, Eddyville was milepost 28.5. Established in 1868 as Little Elk, it was renamed for Israel Eddy, who was postmaster here in 1888. A spur track serviced the Thompson Lumber Mill, providing employment for the rural community. The mill changed hands over the 20th century, and the mill site was last operated by Yaquina Veneer when it closed for good in the year 2000. This 1913 photo shows a small depot at milepost 28.5, near what became milepost 746 on the Southern Pacific, and today, the Portland and Western. There is a lot to managing the working forest lands along the Toledo branch. We saw a logging operation earlier on a clear cut. After the wood is harvested, a broadcast burn is performed before the next generation of trees is planted. Not only will it make the ground easier for tree planters to walk in and reduce the fire danger, but it also gives the new seedlings a head start without being choked by heavy brush. This is what is called a hand light. The fire crew is using drip torches, which carry a mixture of gas and diesel that is poured over a burning wick. Broadcast burns are done when the fire danger is low, yet the moisture level is low enough to prep the unit for planting. These men are trained for wildland firefighting and have a great deal of experience fighting forest fires during the summer months. The haze of distant forest fires hangs in the air on a hot August afternoon. The train passes through Eddyville over Little Elk Creek and through the crossing of a bypassed section of Highway 20.
Eddyville is one of the few sidings remaining on the line, and the only siding between Toledo and Summit. It is only 1,770 feet long and used occasionally for storing cars if there's not enough room for them at Toledo. The railroad departs Eddyville in a mainly northeasterly heading that gradually opens into a small valley. At this point, the heavy grade to the summit of the coast range is still over 10 miles away. Former Santa Fe GP39 Blue Bonnet number 2308 leads the train to a rural grade crossing at milepost 743. On a different day, we get a ground shot at the same crossing. Transitioning back to October of 1995, SP4449 negotiates the many curves near milepost 741.6 at Hutchcroft Road. GP39-2 number 2313 is on the point in this springtime scene near milepost 740. As we continue through the remote coastal hills and valleys toward Nashville, 
Don't be surprised if you find ornaments like this bicycle fastened to a tree. We found this decoration along the Eddyville-Nashville Road near the railroad's fifth crossing of the Aquina. Not far east of the fifth crossing, the 3001 has stopped for a crew change at the former station of Norton's, milepost 738.8. The new crew gets a warrant from the dispatcher. All right, uh, be a correct for back track horn 27, 27 PWR 3001, 3001 East EAST, proceed from Opel MP741741. The conductor informed the dispatcher the train was 23 by 6, meaning it has 23 loads and 6 empties. A plaque near the grade crossing indicates the first school in Lincoln County was here in the community of Norton's in 1866. The Porters were a prominent pioneer family in the area. The white schoolhouse can be seen in the distance in this early view of Norton's. The hillsides above the town show the charred remains of the Aquita Burn, which ravaged over a half million acres between 1847 and 1853. Although devastated by fire, the naturally cleared land was a blessing for settlers, 
when the Homestead Act was signed by President Lincoln in 1862. A freight warehouse and depot stand beneath a giant snag from the Yaquina burn. And by looking at the platform, it looks like someone has some fencing to do. Just east of the depot, the new G.E. Wilson General Merchandise Store is open for business. Stores like this stocked the necessary supplies needed on the 160-acre stump ranches that existed here at the time. Today, the open country around Norton's is again a jungle of trees, including one which we have dubbed the Charlie Brown tree, growing out of this stump. A local resident has even gone so far as to add Christmas ornaments to the sapling. East of Norton's, the railroad makes the second crossing of the Aquina on a 304-foot trestle at milepost 737.2. The engineer whistles for a crossing of the Eddyville-Nashville Road on the east end. This view is from the crossing, as PNWR 3001 leads its train over the trestle, which doesn't look too impressive from this angle. There is still one more crossing of the Aquina before trains begin the steep climb to Summit, but it's a few more miles up the line. This is the Davis Creek Bridge at milepost 736.2. It is 195 feet in length and shows quite a bit of movement when trains cross. Watch how much this bridge flexes under the weight of the loaded cars.
Yet another trestle can be found over Clem Road and Humphrey Creek at milepost 734.4. Milepost 734 is located near the west switch of the former siding of Nashville. In the early years, helpers were once added here to eastbound trains for the climb to Summit, and a turntable was located nearby. The siding is now a single-ended spur track used by maintenance of way. Flat running is almost over for this train as it lumbers through Nashville. Transitioning to summer, PNWR 3002 is in the lead at Nashville. These empty chip guns are passing the site of the old turntable to the right of the track and a 50,000 gallon water tank on the left. Stepping back in time, we see a pair of Southern Pacific 12 wheelers at the water tank preparing for the assault on the 2.58% grade to summit. The wooden structure in the foreground is the turntable. An earlier image taken in 1913 shows the Nashville Depot and two freight warehouses during the years of the Corvallis and Eastern. Note the slaughtered hogs stacked in the shade along with the milk cans. An aerial view from the mid-1940s shows the Ted Hampson lumber mill, which was built around World War II. It later burned in 1949, and another mill was built at the same site. The turntable is clearly visible across the street from the Nashville store at the bottom of this image. 
That store is still in place today. The mill, depot, and freight houses are now a thing of history, and Nashville is nothing more than a junction in the road at the bottom of the grade to summit. The eastbound patch crosses the Logston Road near the Nashville store. The old Hampson Lumber Mill site is just above the train. The train is about to negotiate a giant horseshoe as the railroad wraps around the former mill site. Back at track level, the 3002 approaches the horseshoe and the first crossing of the Aquina. Moisture is the enemy of most things man-made in western Oregon. Water squirts out of a steel tie, which is used to keep the track engaged. It has been a long time since this line has seen fresh ballast. Vine Maple announced the coming of spring to the Coast Range, and Hazelnut are putting on new leaves near the first and final crossing of the Aquina River. This trestle is 162 feet long and stands 30 feet over the river, which is now just a tiny freshwater stream. Less than a tenth of a mile around the curve is a very significant milepost on the Toledo Branch. 733 marks the start of the heavy grade to the summit of the Coast Range. Newer 136-pound rail has been added to this curve, and the old rail still lay in the ballast, giving the illusion of double track. PNWR 2315 leads the patch around the tight curve in preparation for the climb. Reaching milepost 733, the engineer begins notching up as the stiff 2.58% grade begins in earnest.
After crossing the river, the grade doubles back just inside the timber and on the uphill side of the mill. The EMDs have been just above idle for the past several hours and put on a fantastic smoke show as they start up the four-mile grade. With the summit of the coast range in the background, the Toledo Patch climbs through the timber above Nashville. Hidden by the dense canopy of trees, the grade snakes to the southeast away from the Yaquina River. A surprise unit on this train is the Watco GP35 number 3516. It recently came off the Palouse River and Cooley City Railroad in Washington State. The engine made two trips between Albany and Toledo before being dropped off for Watco in September of 2019. Just around the curve is an impressive 265-foot trestle that rises 40 feet above a draw. This bridge is at milepost 732.2, just two-tenths of a mile below one of the former tunnels on the Toledo branch. It's kind of a weird feeling looking up at a train seemingly suspended in the air as it flies through the trees.
here is what the scene looks like from this grade level perspective. The railroad makes a curve to the right as it approaches the remains of Tunnel 23. This was the second of three tunnels on the Yaquina branch. This Southern Pacific photo from 1925 shows the east bore. The hanging cables or telltales in this image were to alert any brakeman on top of the cars of the approaching tunnel. Here is an undated view of the west bore of Tunnel 23. It was bypassed by the Southern Pacific during an ambitious line relocation project in 1962. The current line runs through the tall trees to the right of the tunnel. Hiking above the present grade, the top of the west bore can still be found like a cave partially hidden in the side of the mountain. An invisible river of cold air pours out of the dark interior. A reverse S-curve now detours trains around the nearly forgotten tunnel. Just above Tunnel 23, the mossy remains of two bypassed trestles poke out of the ground. These were at milepost 731.56 and 731.48. Rather than filling in these trestles, the track was simply realigned around them. Looking down a draw, the patch climbs past the old trestles just out of view. One trestle that was not bypassed is at milepost 731.2. It is 210 feet long and 50 feet tall.
Like many trestles on the line, this one likes to rock and roll. Along our journey, we have seen timber being harvested and a broadcast burn. The third step is the planting of the next generation of trees. In an ongoing cycle in the Pacific Northwest, young dug fir seedlings are planted in the winter months. Within a few decades, this will be a healthy timber stand once again. We are standing in three-year-old timber just above Spildy Creek. Although the railroad is hidden near the canyon bottom, a quartet of hard-working EMDs make beautiful music in this natural amphitheater. After rounding a curve, what railroaders call Big 60, the diesels emerge on the far side of the canyon near the former site of Tunnel 22. The train disappears into a cut through the older tree stand to the southeast. Hidden in the upper reaches of the canyon was once one of the grandest trestles on the Toledo branch. This was the 60th bridge constructed east of Yaquina, and it garnered the nickname Big 60. Reaching 409 feet across the canyon and standing 105 feet above Spildy Creek, Big 60 was an impressive structure. In September 1962, Southern Pacific undertook an extensive track improvement project in anticipation of much heavier trains with large chip cars servicing the new Georgia Pacific paper mill in Toledo. Those trains did indeed come, 
but not before SP made some track improvements, like more clearance in Tunnel 24, daylighting nearby Tunnel 22, and using its overburden to fill two trestles, including Big 60. The project took place in only six days between September 2nd and 7th, 1962. During that time, Morrison Newton moved approximately 198,000 cubic yards of earth from the mountain above Tunnel 22, filling the gap spanned by the trestle. This is what Big 60 looks like today. The fill at milepost 730.6 is overgrown with trees, appearing now as just another curve in the railroad's climb to summit. Empty gondolas with Willamette and Pacific markings are tacked onto the rear of today's train. They had delivered sections of newer rail for a track maintenance project on the line. As the train rolls out of Big 60, it passes through the remains of Tunnel 22. This view is looking west toward the Big 60 curve, hidden in the trees. And now we are looking east through the 1962 cut. This image shows the east bore of the tunnel as it looked in July of 1925. The photographer is standing just shy of Bridge 61, a 50-foot high trestle located at milepost 730. A westbound special excursion train has stopped near the east portal of Tunnel 22, with much of its train on the 220-foot long trestle. It had been shortened by the time this image was taken in 1962, just prior to the daylighting of the tunnel. Note milepost 730 is clearly visible in this image. In the spring of 2020, the milepost still marks the curve where the trestle used to be as the eastbound Toledo Patch climbs through the daylighted tunnel.
While we have showcased the daylight moves of the Toledo patch over this line, we would be remiss to exclude its nocturnal counterpart. It is a sight that few people get to see. A supermoon illuminates the scene while the silent features of Mary's Peak, the tallest mountain in the coast range, peers over a ridge to the southeast. On a calm, clear night, you can hear the diesels of the Toledo hauler for a good hour before they ever crest the summit. At a quarter after two in the morning, a nearby detector breaks the silence. WP detector, milepost 7, 2, 6. Point zero. No defects. No defects. Twenty minutes later, the whistle is heard for Happy Hollow Road at Summit. At a quarter to three, the hauler follows the beam of its headlights down the 2.58% grade through the remnants of Tunnel 22. One final bridge allows the narrow passage of the Nashville Summit Road near milepost 729. At track level, PNWR 2313 leads the patch towards summit.
In this winter scene, the 3001 nears the top of the grade at mile post 729. Returning to 1995, the SP-4449 makes easy work of the grade to summit near the same location. Trains break over the top of the coast range at an elevation of 704 feet. Summit was a regular stop on the Corvallis and Eastern at milepost 46.1. This 1913 photo shows the station, which included a Wells Fargo and telegraph office, plus a wooden platform to keep passengers out of the mud during the winter months. Besides the station, Summit had a post office and a few stores. When Southern Pacific took over in the summer of 1915, this became milepost 728.5. This image shows another pair of 12-wheelers led by Extra 2938 reaching the summit in 1944. Today, the depot and many of the old buildings are long gone, save the old store and gas station which is now painted pink. On a hot August afternoon, the 3002 drags the patch job over the summit of the coast range and prepares for the 1.4% drop toward the Willamette Valley. On a clear winter day, the fire danger is extremely low, as the 3002 is again leading the patch over the apex with a solid set of GP40s and both slugs. The lighter rail in the foreground is a 1,550-foot siding.
After following a 33-mile course along the Yaquinta River and making a steep four-mile climb to the summit of the Coast Range, the Toledo Branch will now look for another river to guide it into the Willamette Valley. But that's a story for another time. We hope you've enjoyed this look at a rail line that never lived up to its intended use but has still been in use since the tracks were laid in 1884. As always, until next time, thanks for watching.